and welcome to another historical fiction chat today starring Stephanie Dre. I'm so excited to welcome her here. We're talking about the women of Chateau Lafayette. And uh, it's I've started it just the other day. I haven't gotten too far into it yet, but I'm loving it. The, there's three different. Anyway, I'll tell you about the synopsis in a second and you'll know all about it. But I'm very happy to have Stephanie here reading about this and or talking about this. And I know that you guys are all going to want to buy it because, well, you know, because I love it. So you're going to love it. And that's just the way it is. So and it's already on sale. So you can rush out to your store right now. If you're near a chapters or an independent bookseller, head out there and grab a copy of this. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for coming. Um, Stephanie Dre is New York Times, Wall Street Journal and U.S. Today bestselling author of historical women's fiction. Her award-winning work has been translated into eight languages and tops lists for the most anticipated reads of the year. Now she lives in Maryland with her husband, cats, and history books. And now I will tell you about the story. And uh, we were just talking about French accents. I'm not sure if I'm going to share that in my accent or not, but... <laughs> um, you should try, yeah. You can say just a little bit? All right, we'll try. It's been a while, you know, grade 12 French, but... Um, all right, synopsis of The Women of Chateau Lafayette, an epic saga from New York Times bestselling author Stephanie Dre, based on the true story of, the of an extraordinary castle in the heart of France and the remarkable women bound by its legacy. Most castles are protected by men, this one by women. So it's in three time periods. The first one, a founding mother, 1774, Gently bred noblewoman Adrienne Lafayette becomes her husband, the Marquis de Lafayette's political partner in the fight for American independence. But when their idealism sparks revolution in France and the guillotine threatens everything she holds dear, Adrienne must renounce the complicated man she loves or risk her life for a legacy that will inspire generations to come. That sounds good enough, but there's two more time periods coming up. Um, <laughs> in 1914, a daring visionary Glittering New York socialite Beatrice Chanier, Chanier Chandler, how do you pronounce Chandler. 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 Okay, is a force of nature daunted by nothing, not her humble beginnings, her crumbling marriage, or the outbreak of war. But after witnessing the devastation in France firsthand, Beatrice takes on the challenge of a lifetime, convincing America to fight for what's right. And finally, a reluctant resistor in 1940. French school teacher and aspiring artist Marthe Simone has an orphan's self-reliance and wants nothing to do with war. But as the realities of Nazi occupation transform her life in the isolated castle where she came of age, she makes a discovery that calls into question who she is, and more importantly, who she is willing to become. Intricately woven and powerfully told, The Women of Chateau Lafayette is a sweeping novel about duty and hope, love and courage, and the strength we take from those who came before us. That's so beautiful. I'm excited to hear you read this. You. Um, so now I will disappear and, and everybody sit back with your tea or hot chocolate and enjoy. Hi everybody. So before I start reading chapter one, what I want to tell you is a little secret about writers. And that is that we use words that sometimes we can't pronounce. <laughs> I do not speak French, so there might be some words in here that I butcher, uh, and I hope that you will indulge me. Um, I'm, now, I'm skipping over the prologue, which tells you a little bit about Marta, who, unlike the other heroines in the book, is a little bit immature and at first, and... Um, does not really get what all this big deal about Lafayette is. She could care less. That will change, so bear with me for a while. <laughs> all right, chapter one, Marta, Chavignac Lafayette, The Free Zone, October 1940. I've almost made it, I think, pedaling my bicycle faster when I see the castle's crenellated tower at the summit. I've ridden past yellow, yellowing autumn farmland past the Preventorium's dormitories for boys, and past the terracotta rooftop houses in the village. And despite blistered feet and scuffed saddle shoes, I'm feeling cocky. As I near the castle proper, I'm no longer worried anyone's going to take what I've carried all this way, which is probably why I'm so surprised to see Sergeant Travers' old back cit black citrion parked by the village fountain. 
What shit luck. Sergeant Matraver patrols our village every evening on his way home. For some reason, the gendarme is early today, and having stalled out his jalopy, he's got the hood up to repair it. I try to ride past, but he notices and waves me over. My heart sinks as Trevere approaches, doffing his policeman's cap, then resting his hand on the holstered pistol. What have we here, mademoiselle? I pretend to be calm while he peers into my bicycle pannier baskets. Just some supplies from Polygay. That's the nearest little town where I bought dried sausage with ration coupons, but I traded on the black market to get sugar, paper for my classroom, and medicine for the doctors at the preventorium. Black market barters for hard to find goods are illegal, but I took the risk anyway for a good cause. Of course, I had a selfish motive too, one the snooping constable uncovers with a disapproving arch of his bushy brow. Cigarettes? According to our new leader, Marshal Pétain, French women who smoke, not to mention foreigners and unpatriotic school teachers, are to blame for France's defeat. Personally, I think it had more to do with Hitler. Maybe even it had to do with military leaders like Pétain, who believed in fairy tales like the stupid Maginot line to keep us safe. I can't say something like that, though. I shouldn't even think something like that about the marshal, the man who saved France in the last war, and as everyone says, the only man who can save us now. But man, what smug idiots got us into this war. Hitler's panzer division rolled past French defenses five months ago. The Allies fled at Dunkirk, leaving 40,000 French soldiers to cover their retreat and hold the Germans back. All for nothing. 18 days later, we surrendered to the shock of the world. Like almost everyone else, I was relieved. I thought the fighting would stop and that Henri would come home. But now a swastika is flying over the Eiffel Tower and France or what's left of her below the line of demarcation, is neutral, while Britain fights on alone. Almost two million French soldiers are prisoners of war, including Henri, my Henri. Given all that, smoking is the only thing that keeps me sane. So the lie comes easily. The cigarettes are for the Baron. The gendarme looks over his shoulder at the castle and says, I took the Baron de Lagrange for more a man who prefers a pipe. The Baron is now the acting president of the Preventorium. The Baroness trained as a nurse in the last war and has a knack for organization, but unfortunately women aren't supposed to run anything now, so her husband got the job. And as the founder of an elite pilot training school and a senator with connections in the new Vichy government, the Baron is too powerful to question about cigarettes. Javert knows it and knits those bushy brows. For a moment, I think he'll shrug and walk away. Instead, he sweeps autumn leaves off the low stone wall and leans against it. It gets lonely around here these days, mademoiselle, does it not? Tell me, what does a school teacher with such pretty blue eyes do when class is not in session? <laughs> I lie about eating chocolates. What does he think? There's 400 sick children to feed at the preventorium which means growing vegetables, making cows in the, in the dairy, and helping to raise and butcher pigs. Every day since the war started has been a struggle, but I don't think he cares about that. No, I think the gendarme is after something else when he reaches for my wrist and traces it with his thumb. Your tone is sharp, mademoiselle. You ought to show a little more respect for an officer of the law. I probably should, considering that he could arrest me or seize my ill-gotten gains, but I'm too angry that he's touching me. I don't think he'd dare if I were wearing my engagement ring. It's tucked under my scarf, hanging from my neck on a chain, because it kept sliding off a finger that has become like the rest of me, thinner than before the war. Thinking about it makes me combative. You really want to know what I do when I'm lonely? I kiss the picture of my fiancé, praying for his safe return from his prisoner of war camp. That's enough to shame the gendarme, who shrugs like he was just testing me. I wish all French women were so devoted. <sighs> oh, sure, I was so devoted that I made Henri wait until the very last minute, once it was too late to arrange the wedding he wanted. Feeling miserably guilty, I look away, and the gendarme notices. 
You're certain you have nothing to hide, mademoiselle? Your cheeks are pink. The air is chilly, I say, tugging my old red beret down over my ears. And, and I exhausted myself standing in line at the shops at Polygay all morning and on the ride back. This is a stupid lie, because Trevere knows I've been hiking, camping, and hunting in these rugged woods since I was in pigtails. A bicycle ride isn't enough to wind me. Then again, everything is harder when you're hungry. Trevere puffs out his barrel chest. Exertion is good for you. The marshal says to stay fit, get lots of exercise and fresh air. I could run. I could outrun Trevere in a foot race any day but I'd rather not have to, so I settle on sarcasm. We must fight the rot of the decadence and restore the honor of France, no? He laughs, and I laugh too, but neither of us is amused. According to the marshal, the honor of France is so fragile that it was lost to art, accents, women, and wine. Meanwhile, on the BBC, the rogue General de Gaulle says French honor can be restored only by suicidal resistance against the Nazis. I don't believe either of them. These days, it's hard to believe anything but self-interest. And it's self-interest that saves me. Tempted by the dried sausage peeking out of its paper, Traver breaks off an end for his lunch and leaves me the rest. Au revoir, mademoiselle. He knows I'm guilty of black market bargaining, or he wouldn't have taken a piece of my sausage, so I don't argue. Adieu. Once inside the castle gates, I dodge mud puddles in the drive where the ambulance has been stranded for a week without fuel. The children are at recess, wearing scout uniforms. It seems everyone wears a uniform of some kind these days to restore our morals. A fair-haired eight-year-old who came to us from Lille, affected with rickets, now hops off the swing set. Her corkscrew curls bouncing as she runs through fallen leaves to greet me, calling, Maitress, Maitress. She's followed by an asthmatic 15-year-old from Toulouse, who's almost cured and ready to go back to her family. Both girls are curious about my package, so I scold, No peeking. It's a surprise for the kitchen. The littlest's eyes round. Did you find cat tongue cookies? Our Lafayette kids all love the buttery crisps sent to us by Madame Beatrice from New York. They don't know our supplies are dwindling because of the blockade. For the children, the war seems far away, and we want to keep it that way. So I say, we have to save the cookies for Christmas. But you might get a little sausage in your lentil soup. Now go play before nap time. When the girls run off, I stow the bicycle, tuck the cigarettes into my back pocket, and take the parcels to the old feudal guardroom kitchen, which the Baroness has all but transformed into a modern canning factory. She's determined to pickle and preserve every last edible thing before winter sets in. Assisted by the school's doyen, Madame Le Verrier, and the foundation's general secretary, Madame Simon, both of, both of whom are as much a part of this castle as the wooden shutters on the casement windows. Working beneath old copper pots that hang from the vaulted ceiling, the three women greet me as a heroine for finding even a little sugar. But I don't stay to bask in their praise, because the last thing I want is to be pressed into making wild strawberry preserves. I'm in such a, hur a hurry to escape canning duty that I nearly plow over poor Dr. Anglade, who's coming down the castle's winding main staircase with a tray of syringes. When he sees what I've got for him, though, his stern expression melts. Sulfonamide, he whispers reverently. Dr. Boulanon said he couldn't expect a shipment in Polygay for a week. Where did you get it? It's better you don't ask too many questions. Or at least that's what Madame Simone told me when emptying the preventorium's discretionary cash box to send me on this mission. She also said... When there's a war on, it's best not to tell anybody anything they don't need to know. Now Dr. Anglade eyes me warily through his round, wide-rimmed spectacles. Can you get more? I shake my head. It's somebody else's turn to risk trading on the black market. Doing it once was impulsive. Twice would be stupid. I've always believed that you shouldn't put your neck out for others unless you want it chopped. So having done my good deed, I trudge to my classroom a plain chamber featuring rows of wooden desks for little girls and one for me. 
Over the door hangs a new portrait of the marshal, white haired, white whiskered, and in uniform. Every teacher in France is supposed to enlist children to send drawings and letters and stories to the new head of state as a so-called Christmas surprise for the marshal. I resent this. Our sick kids are with us at the preventorium only between six months and two years until they're cured. My job is to see they don't fall so far behind in schooling that they can't pass examinations for their certificate of primary studies. I teach them reading, writing, and mathematics. I don't have time to teach them about the marshal or his so-called new national revolution, or maybe I just don't want to because my feelings about both are mixed. Not that I have the right to judge. I'm no war hero and everyone says the marshal is doing the best he can. After all, with half the country occupied by the Nazis we're all held at gunpoint and it's impossible to know which of the new laws the marshal is forcing down our throats and which Hitler is forcing down his. Brooding about this, I make 15 copies of tomorrow's spelling test, spreading the master copy out onto the hectograph tablet until the ink is ready. Then I carefully press the paper to the gel and smooth it until it's a perfect mimic. I'm always particular about making worksheets because it's about as close as to creative art as I get now that we're short on pens, paper, charcoal, and paint. And while the copy is dry, I look over the Christmas surprise assignments. One of my students has drawn the marshal as a lion wearing a French military cap because I told her he was called the Lion of Verdun. And now I laugh because she's given her lion a mustache. I'm less amused by the sycophantic essays written by the older girls about how the marshal has given France the gift of his person. Maybe I'd be feeling more charitable if Henri weren't in a prison camp under the terms of surrender the marshal negotiated. I'm still hungry after a few slices of dried sausage at my desk. Here in the countryside, we still have eggs and fruit and even butter, but it never seems like enough. Cigarettes take the edge off, so I'll have to find a secret spot in the castle to smoke where I can't be caught by our household management teacher, Faustine Xavier, a prissy little tass tattletale who always wears her starch collars too tight and her hair pinned too tight. Fortunately, I know all the secret spots. The old hidden feudal passages are too cold this time of year, and I'm too claustrophobic to spend much time there anyway. But the attic has sunny windows, which makes it a favorite haunt of the castle cats, and I like it too. It's where I used to sculpt and sketch, but no one goes up there anymore. So when I push the ancient door open wider on its rusty hinges, I'm startled to see a silhouette in the window seat, and the silhouette is equally startled by me. Sacre bleu! A dark-haired beauty emerges in statuesque splendor, silk blouse, bright red, red lipstick, and a cigarette holder between her fingers. I thought you were Mama coming to catch me up. Your Mama? I ask, confused. The elegant stranger stares. Mart? I stare back without recognition. She smirks. You don't remember me, do you? I feel like I should. No artist should forget cheekbones like hers. But lots of people pass in and out of this castle every day and have every day of my life. Still, I find something familiar about her long, dark eyelashes. <laughs> it was about 10 years ago, she prompts. Mama brought me here for some holiday function. You were one of the only girls at the orphanage, so I knitted you a red beret, and you took me sledding. That jogs my memory. I was 13, and she was 12, sporty and boyish. She's all girl now, which is why I didn't recognize her as the Baron's daughter. Anna de Lagrange? Flashing an Art Deco wedding ring set on her left hand that nearly blinds me with the green sparkle of its big emerald baguettes, she says, oh, I can't, became the Comtesse de Goubriant just before the war. Not that marriage would stop Mama from scolding me like a child if she caught me smoking near her sacred relics. She gestures irreverently to the crates filled with old donations to the castle's museum that haven't been sorted yet. Uniforms, maps, flags, tokens of the supposedly unbreaking alliance of Western democracies that helped win the last war. But in this war, our British allies left us at Dunkirk and the Americans let Hitler invade us with a neutral shrug. 
So as far as I'm concerned, these crates contain the detritus of a dem democratic alliance in decay. And given the current state of affairs, I don't think a little tobacco smoke is going to do them any harm. So you're a contest now. I make a whistle that sounds like la di da. Should I curtsy? She laughs. Don't you dare. I don't go by the noble title except to irritate Mama with the reminder that I outrank her. But unfortunately, she's too American to care. I grin, stooping to pet the great cat that circles my ankles. I actually still wear that red beret, you know. Everyone in the village sees me coming a mile away. And don't worry about your mother. The Baroness is too busy pickling everything in reach to come up here. Anna pats the window seat beside her an invitation to me, the cat, or both. I'd offer you a cigarette, but it's my last one. Thanks, I've got my own. I show her the blue package with its winged helmet, but I don't have a holder like hers, and I wouldn't use one if I did. Gawa. Gitane, she says, snapping shut an empty diamond-crusted cigarette case. Well, isn't she all sparkle? Taking a long drag, she says, this summer, when the air sirens in Paris sent me scrambling, this cigarette case was the only thing of my husband's I managed to rescue from our apartment. If I'd been thinking clearly, I'd have grabbed the framed picture from the wall. Now all I have to remember him by is this. She pauses, savoring the distinctive sharp smoke as if tasting a lover's tongue. I feel as if I've intruded upon a private memory until she leans forward to light my cigarette with the glowing end of hers, pulling me into the intimate moment. And I'm caught there. Is your husband, is he a prisoner? She says, Papa tells me your fiance is too. I nod, Stalag 8A, somewhere near Poland. Her pretty face twists with sympathy. I'm so sorry, Mott. I nod, feeling sorry for her too. What a lousy thing for us to have in common. What brings you to these hinterlands? She shrugs. I fled to be a Reese after the armistice, but Mama wants to breed down my neck, so here I am with nothing to do. Oh, there's plenty to do here. Mostly work, though. I wonder if Anna knows how fortunate she is to have a mother to worry after her. I envy her but I already like Anna more than I envy her, and I don't like many people. Besides, it's nice to have someone my own age to talk to again. Don't worry, she grins. I'm not expecting a vacation. I have a few tennis and swimming trophies to my name, so come summer, I'll give lessons to the kids. Meanwhile, Mama is putting me to work with Madame Simone. My condolences. Anna looks wary. Simone's that bad to work for? I shrug. She's blunt, but she keeps licorices for the kids in that leather briefcase of hers, so she's not all bad. But her office is in the Square Tower, where we keep all the Lafayette Memorial Foundation's paperwork. Accounting books, admissions applications, discharge forms, medical, academic, employment records. In short, it's the dullest place in the castle. Which is why what I tell Anna is... It's just a chaos in the records office every 15, 15 of the month. That's when the days, I'm sorry, that's the days the kids are admitted to the preventorium. Anything else I should know? A lot of boring stuff. But I want to impress her, so I say, there are secret passages in the castle. Her eyes brighten. Really? Where do they go? Nowhere now. They've been sealed up. But as kids, we were terrified of getting lost in the walls and turning into a pile of bones. So there must be ghosts. Doesn't every castle have ghosts in the movies? She grins wider. Which reminds me, do you fancy going to the cinema with me sometime? My treat. Blowing a ribbon of smoke, I give her an unfortunate dose of reality. I'm told there are three cinemas in Claremont Ferrand, but that's hours away. Anna sighs, fiddling with the bow of her blouse. We really are in the middle of nowhere. Honestly, Mart, I was surprised to learn you stayed on as a teacher here. I didn't figure you for the type. Oh, I'm not. 
I reply, waving my cigarette as evidence. This year's letter of instruction says teachers are to serve as a moral example and are entrusted with the whole future of the nation. Well, if that isn't just a little bit more than I'm willing to take on. We both laugh, and it's a real laugh. Flicking our ashes out the cracked window onto the terracotta roof tiles, we fall into easy conversation about books, movies, and art. She remembers that I used to sketch and notices my old easel in the corner. Oh no, I accidentally invaded your sanctum sanctorum, haven't I? Don't tell me you're using this icebox as your studio. Not since the war. In agreeing to marry Henri, I've given up dreams of a formal education in the fine arts, but that didn't stop the desire to create. And now I'm fighting off a different kind of hunger. I'm not really working on anything anymore. Why not? I stare at my scuffed sta saddle shoes. What's the point? We're all too busy trying to get enough food, enough fuel, enough medicine. I can't justify using up papers and pencils and desperately needed supplies on artwork. That seems somehow trivial. I feel like a pretender anyway. I don't say any of this to Anna, who finds my bust of Adrienne Lafayette and gasps. Is this yours? I nod, embarrassed, and stub out my cigarette. It's not any good. It's all wig and eyebrows. But Anna's interested. She stares a long time, really studying my work. I find myself holding my breath, and I don't exhale until she says, This piece might be brilliant, actually. It's not the usual shiny marble. It's rougher. You've given a glimpse into the woman's humanity, warts and all. Please, but afraid to look at Anna, I say, it's not good enough. To, I'm not good enough to work in marble yet. But I left the soapstone unpolished, hoping the texture would give it a modern edge. It really does. Where did you learn to sculpt? Madame Beatrice gave me a few lessons. The somewhat mysterious founder and president of the Lafayette Memorial Foundation is a polymath. Actress, sculptress, and author of a book about an obscure desert queen. I was always flattered by the special interest she showed me on her yearly visits to the castle to oversee the charitable venture. I was touched by her warm encouragement, too. Of course, Madame Beatrice studied and mastered the neoclassical style, whereas I'm just sketching and sculpting by instinct. Then you have a natural gift, Marta. You can't let it go to waste just because there's a war on. And with these words, I feel like she's shaken me awake from a long slumber. And that's the first scene break. I don't know if you want me to read on. I'm going to do a quick. I think that's good. That was beautiful. And, oh, and thank I, you. I love Marta. I was mentioning this before. And I know I like the way you introduced her as someone who really doesn't care about being in this castle. Um, as if anybody could not care about being in a, in a castle. But I love her voice. I love the way you created her as a. She's a feisty, no nonsense, like whatever, I'm here to do a job and this is sort of how it is. And it made me wonder, cause you have three different time periods. Yes. Which means, and readers I think are, are always, and so are we, lulled by the whole idea of an author's voice. And so now you have the challenge, you have chosen to have the challenge <laughs> of having three different time zones. So three different voices. Is there, did you have, special challenges did you have a favorite like which is the easiest for you to to reach I, I know for me when I used to write a long time ago stuff that was centuries ago it was harder to find them I think um for me the research gets harder the farther back you go but I could just because I'm a little bit lazy but the the newer the the 1940s stuff I don't know for me it's easier did you have a, a favorite or? <laughs> So I actually had the opposite experience in this book because of the research. Um, I've been writing 18th century fiction for a long time. Um, My Dear Hamilton, America's First Daughter, Ribbons of Scarlet. So I'm very familiar with the very formal cadence and sort of ancient usage of words. Um, I was very comfortable with Adrienne's dialogue, which much of which comes from her own letters, which we still have. Yes. Strangely, in this story, 
the World War II is actually the period of this extraordinary castle in France, Lafayette's castle, that we actually know the least about. The records from the period have gone missing. And so I was only able to reconstruct this period through the testimonies of French resistance in the area. And they told, they tell us that there was a French school teacher at the chateau who helped them hide. And we know that Jewish children were hidden in the chateau, but, um, and I want to show reader, this came out of um, a memoir called Saved by the Spirit of Lafayette. This little girl was saved at the castle, Giselle Feldman. And she talks about some of the administrators who helped and some who did not, uh, but maybe she was too little to remember their names. And so she doesn't tell us all the time. So I had to invent Marta as the only fictional character. And that, um, that was more difficult for me to get down. Her voice though came very naturally to me once I knew that she was going to be a little bit of a brat uh, who was made that way because she's an orphan and she had to grow up looking out for me, myself, and I. And she makes a beautiful journey in this story. Uh, eventually she's going to grow up and change into a marvelous heroine. And she uses the example of the women in the castle who came before her as the inspiration for the heroic she eventually gets into. Um, now, Beatrice Chandler's voice, my World War I heroine, was delightfully easy for me to slip into because her grandson helped me with this book and he had private papers of hers and her letters. So I have read hundreds and hundreds of Beatrice Chandler letters oh. and she is hilariously funny. She's um, very witty and she has a sort of comedic timing because back in her day, she was a comedic actress and that still comes out in her writing voice. And I knew that I was going to love her best when I read that she had sent a book off to her agent and she hadn't heard from him. And so she worried that her prose was so terrible it might have killed him. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, she's our people, right? <laughs> she's a writer, she knows. She knows how it is. And so it was easy to fall into her voice for World War I. Oh, it sounds like so much fun writing this book. Like when you get really into these characters and they become your friends, you get to know the characters, but these girls sound like they could be really good friends of ours, especially the author, but um, <laughs> you must have had fun. What about the, the earlier, the 18th century? Adrienne, Adrienne, oh, I see now I'm, I'm trying to say it the French way. It's not <laughs> coming out right. Adrienne, is um, she is such a sweet uh, or was such a sweet person. But what shocked me about her is that Adrian is re reported. Everyone tells us that she was very sweet and very gentle and very soft. And yet she had the courage of a lioness. This is a woman who defended her husband against her angry family when Lafayette left France to fight in the American Revolution when he was 19 years old and she was pregnant with their second child. He left in secret against the wishes of the king, but because she believed in the reasons that he came to fight in the American cause, she defended him. She was his representative in France, helping to secure the American alliance uh, with France that ended up winning the war. So she helped Emissaries like Ben Franklin and John Adams and John Lawrence and Thomas Jefferson and so on. Um, she was Lafayette's partner in helping to abolish slavery. She was his helpmate at the start of the French Revolution. And ultimately, she saved his life. She was his savior. We very seldom get to see a story about the damsel in distress who saves the knight errant. But that is this kind of story, and their love is at the heart of this book, and so I just love it. That sounds so beautiful. Okay, so now I have to just stop working today and go and read Margaret. <laughs> what what got you motivated to to research not one but three of these stories all around the chateau? Do you were you working on something that had to do with the chateau, and something hooked you, or? So um, I'll share the sort of writerly backstory since we're 
we're both writers here, is that I had originally wanted to write about Adrienne Lafayette, but at the time, uh, my agent was worried about its salability because she said she's not American, she's not a queen, and she didn't even get her head cut off. <laughs> so um, this is not, not going to sell. Uh, but she hoped that I might find something in World War II. And I hadn't written World War II before, and I, I wasn't really um, sure that I wanted to. And so I sort of quipped to my dear friend, Kate Quinn, and said, well, if only there was a connection between uh, Lafayette and the Nazis, then I could write this book. And of course, that's when I found this memoir, Saved by the Spirit of Lafayette, um, about Jewish children who were saved at Lafayette's birthplace during the Holocaust. Um, and yesterday, of course, was Holocaust Remembrance Day. So I'm especially aware of that. Um, and I began to wonder, this title, Saved by the Spirit of Lafayette, I thought, is there a spirit of Lafayette? Yeah. And I discovered there is. And it's, it's one that's been carried on by the women in his life, generation after generation, centering around the same castle. And I became really moved by this because I thought there's no better legacy that any human being can leave behind than one that other people want to get involved with and spread across the world in good cheer and with uh, an eye towards helping others. Uh, and I just, I thought, oh, I, I want to encourage that too. So if I can be just a little part of that legacy, a little part of helping to spread the spirit of Lafayette, then that is the book of my heart. That is what I want to write. Oh, and it sounds like it. I can tell how much you love it. It's, it sounds beautiful. Um, so all the research that you did for all this, I love the, the way that the book just basically fell into your hands like that. I was, sometimes when you're trying to research something and it's like, oh, I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do with this. And then it appears, it just feels so, to me, it just feels so magical. Like you're meant to be writing that thing. And um, as random as it is, it, it appears at just the right time. So I'm yeah, so happy. and there was another magical moment um, that made me feel like I was meant to write this. And that is that when I found out that there were children saved at the castle, I had to know how did how on earth did Lafayette's castle uh, come to be owned by an American foundation and save children? And I found out that it had been purchased by this American woman, Beatrice Chandler, um, in the First World War. And I thought to myself, Beatrice Chandler, that name sounds so familiar to me. Where do I know that name? And I looked up over my bookshelf, over my desk where there was a bookshelf, and I saw a book by Beatrice Chandler. And that book was called Cleopatra's Daughter, which was a biography about Cleopatra's daughter and the biography that started my historical fiction career oh. because I, my debut was Lily of the Nile, which was about Cleopatra's daughter. I shrieked. I couldn't believe that this was the same woman, but it was the same woman. And I felt like, oh my God, this was Beatrice sitting up over my head the whole time oh. saying, this is the story you were meant to write. I'm telling you, you're, you're going, you're, you're getting close, but you're not there yet. Keep searching. And once I found it, she's like, ah, at last, now you know. Oh, you just gave me chills. That's so yeah. exciting. So you've written like you've written like a dozen books or something, including the anthology Ribbons of Scarlet. And uh, this one sounds like it might be your baby, your favorite. I know it's hard. <laughs> I know. I don't like to. People ask me that and I'm like, eh, I don't choose between my daughters, but. Um, I love all of my children, all of my book children. But this one took me seven years from starting concept to wow. uh, publication. And so I've been living with it and torturing my friends with it for all this time and doing all the research. And so um, it's it's certainly my favorite right now. I, you know, when I move on to the next book, sometimes they eclipse each other. But this one is always going to going to be a baby. Oh, well, congratulations. I'm really excited for you. And um, that just oh, gave me chills. I'm going to go start digging for my own little magic. But thank you very much for being with us today um, and chatting with my readers and your readers. And um, I know I'm looking forward to finishing the book or diving <laughs> even deeper into it because I loved Marta, but the other two are really intriguing as well. So thank you. Again. <laughs> 
Um, Thank you so much for having me. Best of luck with everything. And uh, I guess we'll wait another seven years for the next one. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it'll be quicker. The next one is going to be about um, Frances Perkins, who was America's very first secretary, uh, female cabinet secretary, and um, probably the most influential woman in American history. Wow. So you focus a lot on like actual biographies in a way. So yeah. I've never done that. I just write about events. It must be fascinating to write biographies. And is it hard if you're, um, you know, it, when you're doing a biography, that's actual fact about an actual person. So the research must be really exacting. And then how do you take fictional license with that? That's a challenge. It is. And it it's uh, more nerve wracking the more recent the figure is right okay. like in the 18th century if um if i want to play with lafayette's words i'm, I'm not so worried about that he's been a hero for centuries uh, i'm not offending him either way right but people who are very recently dead they have family that that knew them um and so it's a delicate dance to to get right you don't want to upset living people or defame the recently dead that's so courageous. Well, now I'm even more intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And um, I also want to wish you wonderful uh, luck on your new release coming out. Thank you very much. I'm excited to share it as well. Um, a little bit of Canadian history. So we've got it all going on to get the whole world involved in this and show the magic of history. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day and I wish you all the best. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.